gospel music was embedded into Elvis's life, and uh, he really tried to sing gospel music at the beginning, but he wasn't accepted. He wasn't good enough. I did not want a white man trying to sound like Coffee. I wanted somebody that had that natural feel, momentum that came from the inside, not just from the teeth out. We feel, based upon the experiences throughout the country, that this rock and roll rhythm has been the seed of trouble, and we want to keep trouble out of Jersey City. Well, uh, everything has happened to me so fast in the last year and a half, so uh, uh, I'm all mixed up, you know. I, mean, I can't keep up with everything that's happening. He couldn't understand why people would go crazy over him. As far as he's concerned, I'm just another human being, just like you and I. I mean, it's just that he did not understand why God, whoever this force was, picked him to be who he was. This two-room shack was built by Vernon Elvis Presley on rented land in Tupelo, Mississippi. Vernon, a house painter and day laborer, lived here with his wife, Gladys Smith, who worked on and off at a local garment factory. In the early morning of January 8, 1935, Gladys Presley gave birth to her only children, twins. But the first, Jesse Garen Presley, was stillborn. The death of his brother would haunt Elvis Aaron Presley, shaping his outlook for the rest of his life. Elvis can never be really genuinely understood unless you realize that he would feel about his dead brother. He would feel guilt, he would feel loss, but he would feel something else. He would feel triumph. He was the one who survived. Her only son meant everything to Gladys, who hoped education would give him a better life than she had had. She was determined that, he, uh, that he'd get a good schooling, and there was a good school in East Tupelo, even though East Tupelo was the wrong side of the tracks. So she would walk him to school every day. She would also collect him every evening to see that he didn't play hooky. When you said goodbye, in the early years, growing up in Tupelo, Elvis was influenced by the rich musical environment in which he lived. At the nearby Pentecostal church, Reverend Frank Smith played guitar during services and introduced Elvis to the instrument. On the radio, the Presleys listened to country music and Tupelo singer Mississippi Slim, whom Elvis came to idolize. Here, at the Tupelo hardware store in 1947, you could buy a guitar for $12.95. Elvis and his mother found their way to the hardware store on his 11th birthday. But a guitar was not what Elvis had in mind. It was a 22 rifle, but his mother, after looking at it, said, it was too dangerous for him to have, and she wouldn't buy it. And, and this disturbed Elvis quite a bit, and he had a, just had a tantrum, cried. The man who, who was waiting on them uh, suggested that he show him a guitar. And Elvis said, no, he wouldn't have any part of it. Well, his mother said, son, if you'll just take this now, because you're not going to get a 22 rifle, and this is it or nothing. And said, if, if you'll take this and, and go home, and learn how to play it, said, you might be famous someday. A guitar would be one of the few luxuries young Elvis would enjoy, as his father's job status was intermittent at best. In 1948, he packed up his family and moved to Memphis in search of better prospects. There, the Presleys moved into a small apartment in the poorest section of town. And Elvis, separated from friends and familiar surroundings, drew inward. As a teenager at Humes High School, Elvis developed his own peculiar style. Well, I think Elvis didn't have too many friends when he was young in school, because he was always the strange kid with the long hair and the weird clothes. The classmates said it was just a joke that he was so horrible, that his singing was so horrible, his guitar picking was so horrible that, that it became a, a joke, that a, sort of an end joke, that if you saw somebody else with a guitar, he was an Elvis. That was a put down. Undaunted, Elvis continued to practice his guitar and seek solace in his favorite comic books, like Captain Marvel Jr., I saw that, uh, that he had black glossy hair, that he had in fact sideburns, that he had an emblem uh, that, with a lightning bolt, and that later in life I could see Elvis kept using that lightning bolt. 
I think Captain Marvel Jr., who formed his personality, too, who, uh, humble, humorous, uh, created in him this desire to save the world, to save his family. To help make ends meet, Elvis worked a variety of odd jobs, such as ushering at the Lowe's movie theater, and managed to earn enough to buy his unusual and colorful clothes on Beale Street, Memphis's blues mecca. But the greatest of these is love. Elvis fell in love with gospel music too, and became a regular at all night gospel sings in town, some of which featured the legendary Blackwood Brothers Quartet. We would always let him in the stage door. For one reason, he was short of cash, and most of the time didn't have the price for a ticket. And so we always let him in the back door. Gospel music was embedded into Elvis's life, and uh, he really tried to sing gospel music at the beginning, but he wasn't accepted. He wasn't good enough. So he turned to uh, what was rock and roll then is not what rock and roll is now. He turned to, I call it rhythm and blues is what he sung, really. But uh, I think gospel music was what made Elvis what he is. As Elvis developed his fledgling rhythm and blues style, his friends noticed a new confidence. Most people today, the success makes them a star. When I met Elvis when he was 19 years old, there was something about him when you're a young boy, you know, you want to identify with a sports figure or the movie star, or whatever. Elvis was a star before he had success. He had something that you said, God, I'd like to, I'd like to be like him. In 1953, the Memphis Recording Service, now a landmark, would record a song for anyone who had the $4 for the acetate. Recent high school graduate Elvis Presley had a job driving a truck at the Crown Electric Company. It was this truck that Sun Records founder Sam Phillips remembers passing by his studio day after day. Well, we were on the corner of Main and Union, 706 Union, which is uh, almost downtown Memphis. A lot of traffic, but when you see a Crown Electric truck go by day in and day out and day in, you must think, well, they've got a lot of business in this neighborhood. But that was Elvis, as I later learned, trying to get up the courage to pick the right day that he could stop and come in. Sam Phillips had been recording black artists for years, such as rhythm and blues pioneer Little Junior Parker. But word around town was that he was looking for a white man with the Negro sound. I was not trying to set an agenda to get blacks and whites together as such. I was trying to say, look, we have got a common soul. That summer, Elvis finally got up the nerve and walked into the Memphis Recording Service, a move that would profoundly alter both his and Sam Phillips' lives forever. It was well known in Memphis in the mid-1950s that if you went and made a record at the Memphis Recording Service, it was the same thing as getting an audition at Sun Records, because Sam Phillips owned them both. Marion came back and says, this is Elvis Presley, and he would like to make a record for his mother's birthday. He really had a certain type of innocent, decent, nice-looking young man, uh, and there was just something that all of a sudden I felt deep down in my soul. Don't ask me what. I do not know what. Anyway, uh, we made the record, and when I heard it, uh, when I first heard him, I just knew that the guy it didn't take a genius to say, hey, here's an unpolished voice, but here's a voice that makes contact. I told him I was going to Nashville, and... If I found a song or two that I thought he might uh, be able to do, I'd give him a call. Phillips kept his promise and called Elvis a few months later. He teamed the youngster with local musicians Scotty Moore and Bill Black. I asked him, did he have a band? And he had told me uh, before, he told me when he was in there, that he didn't sing anywhere and he didn't have a band. So I knew Scotty Moore had a lot of patience. I knew Bill Black had none. 
but he was a good slap bass player, and so we could use slap bass for drum and <laughs> bass. So anyway, we put them together and told them to go woodshed and especially try to do this uh, song. After weeks of practice, Elvis, Scotty, and Bill recorded Elvis's first release, That's All Right Mama. Sam took the record to his friend Dewey Phillips, a hot local DJ at WHBQ Radio. Dewey liked the debut record so much, he played it 14 times in one show. With a local hit on their hands, Elvis and the boys began playing small shows locally throughout the South. On any given evening, one might encounter Elvis backstage in the company of other Sun recording stars, like young Johnny Cash, and Carl Perkins, who went on to write Blue Suede Shoes, or perhaps Buddy Holly in the days before the crickets. It wasn't long before Sam booked Elvis at the Grand Ole Opry, a dream come true, but response was less than enthusiastic. Not long after, Phillips got Elvis on the bill with country icon Hank Snow, which in the summer of 1955 brought him to the attention of Snow's partner, Tom Parker, a promoter with a colorful past who liked to be called Colonel. He had a life of scams before Elvis, before getting, but he was very well grounded in, uh, in handling uh, uh, country singers. Uh, Gene Austin for a moment anyway, Eddie Arnold until that split up, uh, Hank Snow. So he was really important as far as getting Elvis on these important shows. Hank uh, Snow had a very important show. Hank Snow says he found Elvis. The colonel said he found Elvis, and that's been going on for a while. Parker liked what he heard and convinced the Presleys to let him manage young Elvis for 25% of his earnings. Soon after, the colonel persuaded RCA to buy out Elvis's contract with Sun Records. Selling Elvis was one of the most difficult decisions I ever had because, number one, um, he, there was no doubt in my mind at that stage that he was going to be big. But boy, I needed the money. RCA paid an unprecedented $35,000 for Elvis to Phillips, who hoped to use the money to develop his other artists. RCA also paid a $5,000 advance to Elvis so he could buy a Cadillac. The colonel immediately began marketing Elvis. But more than any balloons or photographs, Elvis's best marketing tool was his performance on stage. Wild, energetic music like no one had ever heard before. And a way of dancing that drove female fans crazy. His swivel-hipped style may have won him fans, but their reaction truly scared Elvis's mother. Gladys Presley tried to support her son's new career, but was simply not prepared for the extent of his success. The girls went absolutely stark raving mad and rushed to the bandstand to grab him. And she got in the way and said, what are you trying to kill my son for? We're not trying to kill him. We just love him so much. We just want a part of him. Elvis's stage antics also created a rising tide of moralist backlash. Find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it, and I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. When he gets on the stage, he starts to drive those girls nuts by shaking and jumping and laying all over the stage, you know what I mean? Right. And I mean, you think that's bad? Well, it's kind of crazy. The uproar over Elvis threatened rock and roll itself. Rock and roll has got to go. And go it does at KWK. We're all through playing rock and roll records. This week is record-breaking week here at KWK. And after this week, no more rock and roll will be played on the air. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with a nigger. It is obviously nigger music. The controversy thrust the teen idol into one of America's first battles between censorship and pop music. To stem the rising tide of criticism, it was arranged for Elvis to tell his side of the story on the WRCA TV show High Gardener Calling. I don't see that any type of a music would, would have any bad influence on people when it's only a music. I mean, uh -huh. uh, uh, I can't figure it out. I mean, in a lot of the papers, I say rock and roll is a big influence on juvenile delinquency. I don't think that it is. You know, uh, less than two years ago, you were earning $14 a week as a movie usher and then $35 a week for driving a truck in Memphis. 
today you're the most controversial name in show business. Has this uh, sudden notoriety affected your sleep, your appetite, or the size of your head? Uh, not the size of my head. Uh, it's affected my sleep. What about the rumor that you once shot your mother? <laughs> well, I think that one takes the cake. I mean, uh, Where'd that one come from? Have you any idea? I, I have no idea. I can't imagine. Well, there's another one, too, you may not have heard before. Several newspaper stories hinted that you smoked uh, marijuana in order to work yourself into a frenzy while singing. What about that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. And do you think you've learned anything from the criticism leveled at you? No, I haven't. You haven't, huh? Because uh, I, don't, I don't feel that I'm doing anything wrong. Elvis's next TV appearance, following the explosion of controversy surrounding him, came on the Steve Allen Show in July of 1956. Elvis would make a few concessions he wasn't altogether happy with. Elvis, I must say you look absolutely wonderful. You really do, and I think your millions of fans are really, really going to kind of a kick seeing a different side of your personality tonight. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, I hold your guitar here. It's not too often that I get to wear the uh, suit and tails. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, I think I have on something tonight that's not quite correct for evening wear. Not quite formal? What's that, Elvis? Blue suede shoes. Oh, yeah. I think, I think one of the most humiliating and degradating shows he ever went on was Steve Allen's when he had to sing Hound Dog to a dog who was slobbering and he had to be in uh, evening, you know, in, 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 in tails and white tie. And he did it with a great deal of dignity. In late 1956, a new controversy sprang up as Presley went to court to face assault charges, stemming from a scuffle with a filling station attendant. Elvis was later cleared. But controversy or no, business was brisk. A front page Wall Street Journal article reported sales of Elvis Presley merchandise topping $22 million. In March 1957, Elvis fulfilled a lifelong dream of providing a beautiful home for his parents, buying a Memphis antebellum mansion called Graceland for $100,000. For the 22-year-old megastar, the present and future seemed very bright indeed. Introducing Elvis Presley as Clint Reno, who loved his brother, but also loved his brother's girl. Elvis was now the hottest star since Frank Sinatra. Originally called the Reno Brothers, his first film's title was changed to reflect an Elvis hit single. Although it started a dubious precedent by promoting his songs, Love Me Tender showed the world that the untrained Elvis Presley did have some acting talent. Say you want your lover. Say you ain't laid awake every night by my side thinking of him. Wishing I was Vance. Wishing you'd waited for him and never married me. You have stated you would like to be a more serious actor. And uh, do you plan to uh, possibly go to some uh, school or some dramatic school? Well, it wouldn't hurt me any to go to school, but I, uh, I, I learn best by experience. Uh, I never was very good in schools of any kind. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's going to take me a long time and a lot of experience. Elvis and the film got generally favorable reviews, and whether or not Elvis was a great actor, his audience didn't care. The premiere of Love Me Tender turned out one of the largest crowds in movie history. Loving You, the first big modern musical built around the fiery personality of Elvis Presley. I figure his color's yellow, don't you? His second film, Loving You, gave Elvis not only the starring role, but a story about a rock and roll star written specifically for him. It's not my future you care about, it's yours. It's what I can do for you. You don't care about me or Tex or anybody, just yourself. You've got 15 minutes to get on that stage and find out if you've even got a future. How dare you think such cheap tactics would work with me? I need tactics, honey. It's just a beast in me. His next effort was Jailhouse Rock, the world's first rock opera featuring the classic jailhouse scene, choreographed by Elvis himself. In 1958, Uncle Sam sent the rock and roller his draft notice, and Elvis's induction in the army resulted in the most photographed haircut in history. Elvis was offered assignment to a special entertainment unit in the army, but he chose instead to tough it out with the rest of the grunts in the infantry. With girlfriend Anita Wood and his parents in attendance, 
Elvis took the oath. It was a bittersweet moment for the Presleys, as Gladys had always been afraid of losing her son. And now it was really happening. This was one of the last times Elvis would see his mother in good health. Gladys had never really made her peace with the massive invasion of privacy and the general sense of fear her son's fame had caused her. In August 1958, a combination of alcoholism and hepatitis caused Gladys Presley to become gravely ill. Elvis rushed to her bedside. A day later, she was dead. For young Private Presley, it was a devastating loss. It was a silver casket open, and she had on a beautiful baby blue dress that she had never worn. And uh, it was opened, and, and Elvis, you know, kept touching her and kissing her and grabbing her and speaking to her in their own private language. Two months after his mother's death, Elvis and his tank battalion shipped out for Europe. Elvis, you don't get out of the army until 1960. Uh, if rock and roll should diminish in popularity or even disappear, uh, what would you do? Uh, I personally don't think it will ever die completely out. It, uh, uh, because they're going to have to get something mighty good to take its place as far as the young people are concerned. What about, what about cleaning it up or, or at least uh, improving it morally and maybe taking the uh, wiggle out of it? Well, sir, you take the wiggle out of it, it's finished. <laughs> With Elvis gone to Germany, his fans kept the home fires burning. Schoolgirls went on strike because teachers wouldn't allow them to wear dog tags in class out of solidarity with the king. For Elvis, there was at least one benefit to army life. She was very cute and young looking, but yet she was very mature for her age. And at times she was only 14 years old. Priscilla Beaulieu was the daughter of an Air Force captain stationed in Germany. As he boarded the plane home, Elvis paused to look and give her a special wave. Any doubts Elvis had that his fans would wait for him were swept away in the tumultuous welcome he received on his return to the States in March 1960. Are you apprehensive about what must be a comeback? Uh, yes, I am. I mean, I, I, have, I have my doubts, you know. I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to commit myself in saying that I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that because I don't know actually. The only thing I can say is that uh, I'm going to try. I'll, I'll be in there fighting. Elvis's return to Graceland, however, was hardly triumphant. His mother's absence weighed heavy on his mind. In a press conference held in his father's Graceland back office, reporters wondered if with Gladys gone, he might move away. We know your family status has changed since you went into service. Are you going to keep Graceland? Do you have plans of moving away from Memphis or what? No, sir, I have no plans for leaving Memphis. And you're going to keep Graceland? I'm going to keep Graceland as long as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think have any <clears throat> Did you leave any heart, shall we say, in uh, Germany? <laughs> <laughs> Not any special one. The, the stories came out, the girl he left behind. And <laughs> and all that. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that, I mean... <laughs> I had to be careful when I answer a question. <laughs> but despite his answers to the contrary, Elvis was smitten with the pretty teenager. And in 1963, he arranged for her to come and live at Graceland. He could talk people into anything, and he talked them into it. You know, I'm, I'm, I know the father, you know, Colonel Beaulieu, uh, who was Captain Beaulieu at the time. You know, he had his, uh, his doubts. Wait a minute, what am I doing sending my daughter over to this man, this famous rock and roll star that... Uh, uh, don't know what's going to happen, but Elvis talked him into it. Musically, Elvis appeared to get back on track, arriving in Hawaii, where the locals virtually buried him with floral lays. His benefit concert there raised the bulk of the money needed to construct the USS Arizona Memorial. It's kind of hard to concentrate this afternoon. It's hard for me to concentrate any time. But rather than concentrating on his music, Colonel Parker plunged Elvis headlong back into the movie business. Fire! On the way! G.I. Blues was first. A musical reprise of Elvis's army experience, it yielded a number one album and did very well at the box office. Look, boy, the roof's caved in. Captain Hobart's on his way over here. He'll want to talk to you. What about? You're asking me what about who won the bed for us. He did stay in your apartment till morning, didn't he? Flaming Star, which premiered in late 1960, broke out of the mold of the Elvis music movies. 
It was a largely dramatic effort, which won Elvis his best reviews yet from the critics. Do you want to kiss me again? I don't rob cradles. Did you ever see anything like this in a cradle? Yes, the most gorgeous Wahinis on Waikiki are taking lessons from Elvis when he gets a job guiding gals with more than scenery on their minds. His next effort, Blue Hawaii, ushered in an eight-year string of largely undistinguished movies, noted mostly for their tame music and formulaic scripts. Shooting three films a year, at at least a million dollars each, Elvis's finances benefited as his musical career suffered. He was still selling records, but he was no longer the leader, nor the rock and roller he once had been. And Don Juan and Casanova rolled into one. If it isn't a boat, it's girls. Girls, girls, girls. Elvis's 11th film, Girls, 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 was the second to use what came to be called the Elvis Presley formula, and it worked rivaling Blue Hawaii's success at the box office and launching a top five album including the hit single Return to Sender. Much as Elvis craved meteor parts, he simply wasn't getting them. He didn't like the fluff movies that became the genre of the, of the 1960s, but he, he said he was promised that if you go ahead and do GI Blues and get the fans back in the rhythm and everything, we'll do everything we can to put you in serious parts. Something that never happened, of course. Because Elvis was in it, it really didn't matter. As long as they got 10 or 12 tunes for an album and it, when it was a Presley picture, it was an automatic money maker. Over the years, accusing fingers have pointed to Colonel Parker as the manager who sacrificed Elvis's career and happiness for cash. A lot of people will say, well, you know, Colonel was only out for money. Well, if he was only out for money, he would have got a lot of other stars to manage at the same time he was managing Elvis. And he had opportunities to manage a lot of them. And he turned them all down. He says, I'm Elvis's manager and I'm only going to be Elvis's manager. So he was dedicated to Elvis. And yes, they made a lot of money together. To me, they were like, it was like a partnership. Elvis and Colonel were partners. During the greater part of the 60s, Elvis withdrew into his close circle of friends and comrades who came to be known as the Memphis Mafia. He wanted to select friends. He wanted them to be there all the time when he needed them. And that's why. And Elvis was basically a very shy individual. Despite having Priscilla waiting for him at home in Graceland, Elvis widely sampled the carnal pleasures Hollywood had to offer. He was a wild young thing, a hung stud, and they brought out the boogie in him. Hey, let's get real. Who can say no? As a matter of fact, that's one of the few advantages to having a super hit record. Fringe benefits, because, you know, the record company's going to cheat you to begin with. It's a pleasure to hear a man's opinion. Of all of Elvis's female cohorts, there was one the Hollywood rumor mill felt might have a chance to steal him away from Priscilla. On and off the set of Viva Las Vegas, Elvis spent a lot of time in the company of co-star Anne Margaret. A great love affair, two great people, two talented people that happened to hit it off. Boom, boom, boom. I think somebody spoke to the press, and that was the best way to get out with Elvis. Don't put Elvis's business in the street, because he didn't. Elvis also spent a great deal of time during his movie-making years searching for a deeper meaning of life. He got really into it, okay? I mean, he really did. And as far as um, it affected his career at times, you know, I mean, he just really, a lot of times when he would be studying, should be studying for a movie or something, he'd be reading these books that he really got involved in. Many days and nights we'd sit out in the backyard and look up at the stars and trying to figure out what's going on up there. And I think Elvis wanted to know why he was the one picked to be this big superstar that people idolized and uh, they want to know everything about him, where his charisma came from. He did not know. One way Elvis consistently dealt with his embarrassment of riches was to give it away. On one occasion, he joined Frank Sinatra and Barbara Stanwyck in donating $50,000 to an actor's old age home. In 1964, he bought a former presidential yacht and gave it to Danny Thomas to help him raise money for St. Jude's Hospital. And on hundreds of other occasions, he gave away money, cars, and other items to people he didn't even know. One of um, the more famous stories of Elvis's generosity, he was at, a, I guess, a Cadillac dealership and he noticed a, uh, a woman staring through the uh, window at, at his car and he asked her if she liked the car and she says yeah and he says well that's mine but let me get you another one and he went out and told her to pick any car in a lot and he bought it for her on the spot 
He wanted people to love him, and he would give things hoping that people would love him. But yet, I was told when he was a kid, he would give away his toys to other kids. A lot of people could take it. They could take advantage of Elvis' generosity real easy because Elvis was an easy guy to, he was very gullible, you know, they mentioned something that they didn't have or if they really liked something. And you could talk him into things. Now you talk him into it. You could say, boy, isn't that a beautiful watch you have on? And Elvis would take it off and give it to you. On May 1st, 1967, Elvis finally came to grips with his relationship with Priscilla, marrying her in a private ceremony in Las Vegas. Nine months later to the day, daughter Lisa Marie was born. Marriage and a new sense of family happily coincided with other big changes to come about soon in Elvis's life and career. Dan Davis says you guys are nothing but a bunch of British Elvis Presley's. He'll be blind. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> During his virtual absence from top 40 music in the 60s, only the Beatles came close to Elvis's former glory. In 1964, the Fab Four paid a visit to the King in Hollywood, where they stayed up all night in an impromptu jam session. By 1968, Elvis sorely missed his music and had had it with a stultifying movie career. Elvis was getting bored of the movies. I mean, they were the same old thing, a different travel log, a different kid he sang to, a different animal he had. So it was pretty much so uh, that they would not trust him in a dramatic role. They felt that people wanted to hear him sing. And so he just said, I think I'll stop for a while. And uh, him and the Colonel got together and they did the Colonel made a deal for the 68 special. His 1968 comeback special featured an Elvis remarkably at the peak of his form, despite his long sabbatical from live music performance. Back were the trademark sideburns, which had been shaved in deference to his movie career. The show received hit ratings and rave reviews. I never forget before we started taping, Elvis was so concerned that he wasn't able to do a good job on it. He was nervous, very. Uh, uh, uptight, didn't sleep too well. But once he got into rehearsal and he got into it, he got real comfortable with it. In fact, we lived at the studio for about three days when we were taping and Elvis and I slept in the dressing room at NBC. So he didn't want to go home. So he'd be there when he had to do some work. Buoyed by the success of the comeback special, Elvis finished out his existing movie contract and returned to music full time. He went back into the studio to record a backlog of songs that had been building up for eight years resulting in two new albums. One of them, Elvis in Memphis, yielded his first number one hit single since 1962, Suspicious Minds. Elvis's next musical conquest was Las Vegas. Here he checks out construction work on the International Hotel, which was to be the scene of his live stage comeback. He wasn't quite sure how he was going to be received uh, in Las Vegas because he had appeared there in 1956, and he bombed, literally bombed. Um, he was much younger, and of course the people in those days who went to Vegas were not the type of people who were into Elvis Presley music. So it, it was a fiasco. No fiasco this time. Elvis ended up the biggest hit Las Vegas had ever seen. After that, I'll never forget, he came off stage. He was just in another world. He was three feet off the ground. The colonel back came backstage and dressed him. And that, I saw tears in the colonel's eyes the first time ever. He sold out every show there, two, two shows a night. His several Vegas engagements of the late 60s and early 70s saw Elvis return to the top of his performance skills and once again attract fans in droves from around the world. Somebody asked him one time uh, in one of those little groups where he'd walk around and he says, Elvis, he says, wouldn't you just want to be anonymous and, and throw on a baggy sweatshirt and a floppy hat and put on some big sunglasses and just go downstairs and, and walk through the casino, you know? And he says, no. He says, why not? He says, because I love the attention. That love of attention would soon lead Elvis to take his show on the road. Sadly, it was a route that would eventually lead to his demise. First of all, I plead innocent of all charges. In 1972, Elvis kicked off his first major concert tour since the 1950s with a press conference at New York's Madison Square Garden. Getting its first crack at the performer in nearly a decade, the press started off with questions about Elvis's new shaggier look. No, I stopped using that greasy kid stuff, too. <laughs> Just like everybody else did, man. What did he think about the competition? Man, I was tame compared to what they do now. Are you kidding? I, <laughs> I didn't do anything, we just jiggle, you know. Yeah. Are you satisfied with the image you've established? Uh, uh, 
Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. So. How close does it come? How close does the image come to the man? It's, 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 it's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. You don't record hard rock anymore, why? It, it, it's just, it, it's very difficult to find any good hard rock songs. If I could find them, I, I, I would do them. His concerts treated fans to a wide range of music and style, which now included more of his personal interests, such as country and gospel, as he added a former member of the old Blackwood Brothers Quartet to his backup group. Elvis uh, said charisma meant Christ within. And uh, I fully believe that about Elvis Presley. He had that certain something, gift from God of communication through music, regardless of what kind it was. If you ever heard him sing a gospel song, you've never heard anybody sing a gospel song as good as Elvis Presley did. He also brought his love of karate to the stage. A black belt since his army days, he would often work his favorite karate moves into his music. Elvis's Madison Square Garden concerts broke attendance records, which set the performer's management team to thinking. They decided that they were going to have to do something pretty gigantic after that. And they got together and they decided a live concert that would go via satellite worldwide. That had not been done before. The Aloha from Hawaii concert may well have been an achievement even Elvis couldn't top. No entertainer had ever played to a larger audience. Beamed out live on satellite, it was seen by over a billion people in 36 countries. Ironically, at the pinnacle of his career, cracks in Elvis's tower of success began to show. In October 1973, Elvis and Priscilla left a Santa Monica courtroom together, though a judge had just granted them a divorce. The loss of Priscilla, like the loss of his mother, would torment Elvis for the rest of his life. He called me into his bedroom. He said, where did I go wrong? He said, uh, Priscilla's the only thing I ever wanted. Uh, I said, well, you've heard, Elvis, that, that a woman's home is her castle. Priscilla didn't have a home. She couldn't even come out of the bedroom unless she was fully clothed. You had 30 bodyguards standing around. You should have had the bodyguards on the outside of the house. It was a sad divorce, but you gotta remember, Elvis was Elvis. I mean, he could not be a one woman man. There's no way. He always had to have a woman around him. So when he was away from one, he had to have somebody else there. And that's just the way he was. And you have to understand that, you know, I can't explain why but he always had to have the company of a woman with him, because I guess because of his mother. The long hours Elvis began to keep became legendary. They were due in part to his natural energy, due in part to a variety of drugs he would eventually take in increasing quantities during the 70s. He was first introduced to amphetamines during his stint in the Army, given dexedrine to help him stay awake during guard duty. Ironically, he was concerned about the spread of drugs in the entertainment business, making a celebrated trip to the White House in 1970, where President Nixon made him a special agent of the Drug Enforcement Agency. According to some, it was the long road trips of the 70s that got to Elvis. All along in the years we were making movies and stuff, we all took pills to stay awake and pills to go to sleep. You know, but they didn't overtake us like they did in later years when we got on the road. And we went, it got worse and worse, and instead of one sleep and pill to sleep at night, I take two sleep pills to sleep at night, become immune to them. We all did the same thing. Yeah, but Elvis was, um, he never did anything. He had, everything is in excess, everything. Everything he did, and that included in taking any kind of medication. Beset by other ailments such as glaucoma and colon problems, which led to medication that caused weight gain, Elvis lost his looks. But never his voice, nor his hectic road schedule. 75, things started getting tough. It wasn't easy. Uh, being on the road was hard. Uh, it was hard to get him from one point to the next, you know, say, Elvis, we gotta get ready, get up early and get out of here and get to the next town. And, uh, you know, he sort of put you off all the time. Yeah, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready yet. Because it wasn't Elvis, it was the pills and the things we're talking. We were all there to help him, and we all tried to help him. Had many conversations with him, but you know, one guy made a great statement, said, how do you, keep, how do you protect a 42-year-old man from himself? You can't, he has to want to do it. Captured here in rare footage shot by a fan, Elvis gave the last performance of his phenomenal career on June 26, 1977. Less than two months later, on August 16th, as he was preparing to go back out on tour, he was found lying on the floor of his bathroom at Graceland. Elvis Aaron Presley was dead of a heart attack at age 42. The world 
reacted in shock. In Memphis, tens of thousands turned out to pay their respects. Well, it was a terrible day for me. And Vernon sent for me, and I went in there, and he asked me to be in charge to handle the funeral. Uh, so I got Rex Humbard to preach. Got the Statesman Quartet to sing. Of course, the Stamps Quartet to sing. And I had James Blackwood to come in and sing. And uh, we sung the songs that I knew that Elvis loved to hear. As anyone with a TV, radio, or newspaper knows, Elvis's story did not end there at his gravesite next to his mother at Graceland. Rather, a new Elvis story began, a true story of life after death. It's a story that has nothing to do with conspiracy theories or tabloid Elvis sightings, and everything to do with who Elvis was and the fans he left behind. Soon after his death, Priscilla Presley opened Graceland to the public, and it instantly became a mecca for those wishing to keep their relationship with the king alive. Now, over half a million people pass through Graceland's gates every year. I love Elvis, and I've been uh, sending in petitions in the, since the 1980s, and glory, hallelujah, we got our stamp. Even the U.S. Postal Service has gotten into the spirit. First holding an unprecedented national referendum on which likeness of the king should grace a U.S. postage stamp, then printing a record 300 million of them for the first day of issue, Elvis's birthday, 1993. And since his death, the Elvis Presley estate, through merchandising of the Elvis likeness and licensing Elvis's works, has reached a level of financial success that Elvis himself never attained when he was alive. But in the end, the Elvis memorabilia left behind in his stead serves only to remind people of the impact he had on the world. Elvis totally changed the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we sing, the way we dance. Uh, that was an impact not just on Memphis, not just on the south of the United States, but the entire world changed uh, because of that. I think a thousand years from now, or five hundred years from now, or whatever, they're going to start digging up Memphis, and they're going to find that there was this god called Elvis, and they're going to see all these artifacts around, and the people worshipped him in this sort of a way. Elvis was like the American dream, and they still talk about it today. Elvis, from the slums of Mississippi, became this huge star that people just idolized and thought that if he could do it, I can do it. I learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without, without a song, the world would never bend. Without a song. So I'll keep singing a song. <laughs>